special guest for the evening. He is a musician. He is an author. He is a warrior of the road and a grand wizard of rock and roll. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Mr. Gideon Smith of Gideon Smith and the Dixie Dam. Gideon, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, hey, how are you, brother? Thanks for having me on. Doing well, my friend, and glad yeah, you have well. joined us. I want to talk about the new album, 38 Hidden Stores, October 11th. That's next Tuesday on Small Stone Records. Let's get that out of the way right right off the bat. What is going on with the 38 album, Gideon? Oh, man, it's come out, uh, you, you said, in uh, just a little bit. It's uh, really great, man. I'm really pleased with it. I think it's a really strong record and uh, really, really happy to have a new album out and, and just be back in action and uh, driving really hard, man. So I think it's uh, it's kind of like the latest chapter in uh, Dixie Dam uh, in, in my musical history, but it's also... Uh, it's also really exciting because it's kind of like you know uh, the next uh, the next step, next fresh start with coming out of the gates with uh, you know going up to bat, you know, very uh, hitting really hard. Do you have any big touring plans in store for the album? Right now, it's a little too early to talk about it, but uh, you know it's kind of in the works. But I uh, can't really talk about it till I got some stuff you know ironed out in detail. But uh, definitely hope so. Understand that. Yeah, I, well, yeah, yeah. Definitely okay. hoping to, to catch you out if that does happen. I like to make yeah. it out to a show myself sometimes. Thank you, brother. Love to love to have you come down. Awesome. Well, uh, let's talk about uh, the album Thirty Weight, the writing process of it. Um, you know, with many albums, uh, an artist wants to tell a story. Now, whether that be one cohesive story, many individual stories. Or the listener's own story. Uh, where does Thirty Weight fall into those categories? Well, I tell you what, I think that it does. It does tell a story if you read between the lines, uh, you listen to the songs. But I think that the point that you made is uh, is very accurate in that in that it allows the listener to write their own story, and I think that's what what good music should do anyway, and it's uh, which kind of creates a doorway for the listener inside themselves uh, to their own story. And so the music becomes, you know, a soundtrack to their movie. And so songs for me are stories from my life or, or um, you know, uh, inside, you know, you look, read between the lines, you you can you know, can find what they mean to me pretty easily. But it's, it's always uh, something to where what it means to the listener is what is important. And so sometimes when people ask me, what's, what's this song about, I'll tell them. But it's it's to me also too. If you talk about it, explain it too much, it might take a little bit of the mystery away. I think that uh, if a song speaks to you in a certain way, that's what you need to hear, you know. So the album, you know, you, you can go into detail, but I think as far as uh, the story, it's uh, it's your story, man. It's what you get when you hear it, you know. And um, you know, it's about uh, you know emotion, love, uh, you know. Passion, fury, lust, betrayal, strength, being wild, free, loud, you know, uh, and, and living life, you know. And uh, I think it's uh, it's an album with uh, you know, sort of a, a lot going on, a lot being said. But in the end, man, it's rock and roll, you know, and that's what it's all about, you know, just uh, the uh, the drive and the freedom and the love of, uh, you know, loud rock and roll. That I, I think is a great album from what I've heard. You display a lot of range on there as you normally do. But, you know, talking about how you would allow the listener to write their own story based on where they are in their life and how they experience the song both internally and externally, uh, it really takes me back to just, you know, very certain songs that you hear that can almost put you in a time machine and just take you back to a certain moment in your life that you remember crystal clear it allows you to relive that, and, and maybe even in greater ways than it originally was, you know. Oh, man, uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I mean, that's that's an honor, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm glad you enjoy it, and if it does that for you, man, that's, that's that's you know, what more could you ask as, a, as an artist? And, uh, you know, I think that um, I really appreciate your, uh, your take on it, and I'm, I'm, thank you that uh, 
you know, for your uh, your thoughts, and I'm glad to know you enjoy it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, let's talk about just getting into music, backtracking a little bit on your career. Um, do you call the defining moment the moment that just went off in your brain like a lightning bolt that made you pick up the guitar or just create music in general? Man, I tell you, I thought about that many times, and I don't know if I have a really defining moment because it's been with me for so long. It seems like a long, uh, a long, uh, hazy journey. But I think that, um, you know, when I was very young, like like uh, first concert was Kiss, and Kiss in Nantucket in the 70s, at Old Charlotte Coliseum. And uh, I think that uh, hearing a lot of the 60s and 70s uh, rock bands, uh, The Doors and uh, Black Sabbath, Omen Brothers and uh, Skinner, you know, the, the vinyl records, you know, the power coming off those records were... Uh, they were so strong, you know, when I first heard them that, you know, I wanted to create music too, you know, I wanted to, to they really want to be part of it, I just, like what the, what they gave me, I wanted to, to be part, you know, to create it and give that to people too, and I think that, you know, like Sabbath created this uh, really uh, dark, powerful music, and the doors were so mysterious, and uh, uh, the real magical band, the Allman Brothers, brilliant uh, musicians, and Skinner, you know, Kick Ass Band, and you know, I think that those uh, those vinyl records when I first heard them, cassette tapes, stuff like that, the, the the magic coming out of the speaker, you know, it kind of grabbed me, you know, and so then I, I wanted to create that too for for other people. And there's something about the bands from those era. I've been talking about this, talked about it with Hank the Third. I've talked about it with Robert. Um, just as Robert defined it, it was a more simple time, and uh, there was an innocence about things. But just the, the the first six Kiss albums are of the greatest albums ever recorded on any any type of device. You oh know, yeah, uh, man, totally, brother. Card carrying member of the Kiss Army, I have the four oh, yeah. Kiss faces tattooed on my arms. You know, that, yeah, that's, that's how much yeah. Kiss yeah. means to me. That's killer, man. Yeah, that's killer. Well, you know, it's kind of like, I think for a lot of us, uh, Kiss and, uh, you know, they were larger than life, you know, when we first saw them and uh, and that, that lingers, you know, as you get older, it's, it's it still uh, has that, you know, that uh, spark to, you know, Kiss is just, there's like you said, and then you the, you said that Hank III and, and Robert had mentioned that, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, excellent. Now, you, you have tapped into a little bit of that history. Um, when you were recording some of your early demos, apparently you actually recorded in the legendary Sun Studios in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, can you tell us what kind of presence and energy such a hollow ground held for you and what kind of inspiration that gave you there? Oh, man, I tell you, it was it was a fantastic night and uh, definitely a dream and uh, for a Big uh, fan of, of rock and roll and, and um, musician to to get to do that is a fantastic experience. And uh, I went to Memphis and I and I went just to visit as a tourist and I saw that it was still open and I said, wow, you know. Then I found out that they still recorded there and I said, I've got to come back and do it one day. So I called them and then a good while later they called back and they said, come on down. And so I couldn't wait, you know, so I drove out there and, and we uh, went in. They were closing up the, the tourist aspect of the building for the day. And uh, it was me and a friend and an engineer. And uh, it was incredible to, to be in that building. And, you know, it's, it's, that was, you know, it was only 11 years ago, so it was a long, a long, long time ago. And uh, I remember it like you said, Crystal, you know, yesterday. And uh, the... Uh, engineer was a fellow named James and he said you know Bob Dylan got down and kissed the ground right here and and uh Elvis leaned on this door frame and he was kind of giving me all these cool stories so I was leaning on the door frame and thinking man the king you know was right here and then I put my hand down on the ground or Bob Dylan you know whatever and uh then thinking you know I can't believe I'm going to get to do this you know it was, it was super dream for a rock and roll fan and uh using uh, 50-year-old microphones and stuff and uh, thinking of all the greats that had been in that room and the wonderful uh, 
music that had been created there, and it was, it was kind of like visiting a rock and roll temple, you know, history, and uh, and knowing that you had your your moment to be in there too, uh, it, it, it was fantastic, you know, and um, so I was doing some demos and some ideas to uh, to get started, and also to sort of do a little digging into the roots of rock and roll and and uh, what everything that would come after to uh, to kind of dig deep for some secrets, you know. And uh, then when they began to speak, you know, is when uh, the doors started to open for me, you know. And I'm just so thankful I got to do that. It's like uh, in many years since, loads of people have gone down there. But when I went, everybody was saying, why are you doing that? And I would say, if I have to explain it to you, brother, man, you don't get it, you know. Exactly. So, you just don't well, get it. Uh, thank you. So when I went in there, I was like, oh, my God, this fucking could not be cooler. And uh, I went out by the front door. As I was coming in the front door, I poured Jack Daniels on the sidewalk in front of the door, and I was getting down on the ground, you know. And then I walked in, and I was like, I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, I just wanted to get in no, there. No, and, it's uh, Internet radio, brother. No censorship here. Fuck them. Hey, that's, that's all you want. No, <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm not trying to be an unruly guest. So, you know, I, I, I got in and, uh, you know, got to record. I mean, I could talk about it all day, man. But surprised. basically it was it was a great experience and uh, so uh, so cool. And I'm a huge Elvis fan, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the greats that had, that had been in there. And um, just, uh, you know, I kind of like uh, ultimate, uh, one of the one of the dreams of a big, big rock history fan to, to get to go there, let alone record some songs. So, uh, yes, thank you. You know, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, the original home, as you said, of Elvis, of course, is where it's, it's known for. But, of course, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee, excuse me, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl oh, Perkins. Yeah. Oh, uh, the yeah. list just goes on and on. So many of those great original recordings there. Something about that old analog equipment that uh, the digital recording stuff just doesn't catch in my opinion i'm not sure what it is as a more experienced musician uh, do you have any opinion on that oh man i'll tell you analog uh i'm a real nerd when it comes to uh the old gear definitely and i've also uh tried to embrace and get the best of both worlds of the the latest uh, digital style recording but uh the the old recording, like you're, you're speaking of, uh, Sun Studio, uh, at one time I got to record uh, on the Muscle Shoals board, and uh, both of those uh, uh, recordings were so warm and uh, really huge. They have kind of a uh, depth and a uh, big sound to it that's it, just very different from, uh, you know, what everybody's doing you know, right now definitely love the vintage gear and uh and and when you love the music from the the, the studio the era the, you know you you kind of seek to uh learn about that stuff like you're talking about and um i can't claim to be a purist because like i said i've tried to uh you know uh get the best out of both worlds but uh you're right man there's a there's great sound to uh, uh studios and boards and recording like that microphones and uh you know, it's, it's not the same as right now, uh, but, uh, you know, I've tried to adapt and use both to the, but, you know, just to make my music the best I can, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you really have to in this era because uh, the digital stuff, while it may not be, as, as you say, big for the purists where it's uh, it's got that classic analog hum about it, it's also the way more inexpensive route to go and you can get a whole lot more done for a whole lot less digitally in this age compared to what you used to in the 70s and 80s where it was going to cost you for real tape. Oh, yeah, you know it. And, it's you know, man, people, they, they call me an old salt when it comes to recording, uh, and uh, I guess that's true to some degree. But I do uh, I love the digital format, too. I think it's amazing. And so it's kind of like if you look at some of the uh, classic artists uh, from the many years past, uh, what would Hendrix be doing right now if he had, you know, the recording gear they have today? What you know what I mean? So it's a, it's sort of like a, the, the the advances in it. Uh, like you said, it's it's opened a lot of doors and then it creates a lot of possibilities that are, uh, you know, uh, really interesting too. So 
from a, I'm not an audio engineer, but from a musician's point of view and what I do know about engineering or production, uh, you know, I love them both. And uh, I think that, um, you know, it's uh, it's all about just making the music and, uh, you know, capturing a song on uh, in the studio, you know, it's it's like uh, you're, you're capturing into the microphone and it stays. And later, if someone plays it, it comes back out of the speaker and back into the air. And so it's 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 kind of like a really magical process, you know. If you don't record a song, and it could die in the air. And if you record it, then it's there forever, you know. So there's old classic places like you're talking about. You know, like I got to go record on Muscle Shoals board after Sun Studio. And I was like, man, you know, the Rolling Stones had recorded on there. Uh, Almond and, uh, you know... Uh, Wilson Pickett and, you know, so much great stuff, a lot of the country greats, and uh, you think of all the magic that had come in and out of that board. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, that that's fucking incredible, just just the energy coming one way and the other, you know, I, that, that you'd be able to, to maybe tap into that. It, it's just fucking incredible, and I love the philosophy about recording a song that dies, because I, I fuck around here and there writing tunes, and, and, you know, I don't record a lot of the stuff, and that really makes me think, um, you know, I should because my memory is not going to be what it is forever, you know. Oh, man, you got to, brother. Everyone you don't record, you know, you got to record them when you can. And, and you're right about, uh, you know, if you if you can get them down on uh, tape, you never know. You know, they somebody hears it, you know, and, and or you get to hear it or you might forget it. There's songs that I've written I don't remember and I hate I didn't get to record them, you know. And, uh, and, and uh, just remember bits and pieces of them and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I appreciate that, and, uh, and I definitely encourage you, man, to, you know, do all you can, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, the moment of inspiration live here on the air, folks. That's hey, how we you, roll brother. on the Midnight Black Mass. Um, <laughs> now, we would love to talk about your relationship with Small Stone Records, Gideon. You guys uh, have been together for quite a while, um, well over 10 years now. Yeah, and that's a long pretty time. pretty damned impressive in the landscape of modern music. Uh, what makes that so successful? Man, long time. You know, Small Stone is a great label, the great people, and I think that um, they, they give such an uh, extreme uh, attention to the depth of quality, and they really believe in me, you know. And from the, you know, I think I first... Uh, like you said, it's well over 10 years since when I first uh, spoke with uh, the label president, Scott, you know, it was like 1999 or something like that. And uh, all these years, you know, just uh, believes in me, you know, has always been there for me and uh, and uh, given my music a great dedication and focus. And I'm really, really proud of my music with Small Stone and, and uh, you know, the albums we've done and then... Uh, so so much. Uh, they sometimes they you know they they uh, uh, you know never fail to amaze me. You know it's like I think that um, you know they set me up with some of the greatest musicians in the world and uh, and helped uh, helped get my music all over the world. And so I value the label so much as a musician, and I value the uh, label president Scott as my friend. And uh, he's he's kind of like you know, a uh, corner man, if it was boxing, you know, he's like a trainer. He really believes in you and he goes to bat for you. He stands up for you. He's, you know, he's there, you know, and I think that's really rare in the music business to have a guy like that run a label. And it's also rare in the world in general, you know. So I'm, I'm really thankful on many levels for uh, Small Stone and really, uh, really, really glad I, my working relationship all these years and, uh, there are times where I stop and think, you know, uh, I, like I said, I just feel very, very fortunate to uh, have them in my corner. And then here it is now, 2011, and uh, new album out. And I, you know, I think it's, you know, uh, best one yet, you know, and kicking down the door, you know. So it's kind of like um, I'm thankful for it on so many levels, you know. I, mean, I can't really explain it, but as far as you saying a working relationship or what's made it work was just uh, really good people and um, uh, a lot of respect and, and great attention to uh, respect for each other and then and great attention to uh, the quality and uh, drive behind the music and uh, you know with with me you know um, you know I'm you know 
I'm just uh, very uh, extremely uh, uh, driven uh, when it comes to my music. And, you know, Small Stone is like uh, having people believe in you and work with you is, uh, you know, it's kind of like a team, you know, strong, strong foundation. Yes, and, and you have to have that in, in any field of entertainment for success oh, coming from yeah. professional wrestling. You know, I, I've dealt with that in, in many cases. And maybe it's what I do in, as a manager. You know, I have to make sure talent is taken care of, and, you know, if they don't, then I ain't getting paid. Oh, totally, brother. Well, I know you understand. It's like, like you said, it's kind of like I related it slightly to being a boxer, but I know that you know it's like so many things. And, uh, you know, you got you got a good uh, – uh, you know, collaboration of minds, and like you said, I mean, they they leave it to you to do what you do, but they're there to say, you know, hey, you know, I'm in your corner, and I, I never take anything like that for granted. It's like having somebody like that as a friend is a, is a gift, and like I said, as a musician in the business, it's uh, you know, it's awesome. So, you know, I I, I if you'd asked me back in '98 uh, that that I would uh, you know have a uh, that gift all these years, I would be astounded, and so you know, I'm so thankful, you know, and and uh, I met uh, met the uh, the main guy Scott in New York in uh, 2000, and uh, I think he was right around 2000, and and uh, he said, "Man, I definitely believe in you," and that right there, I said, "Man, you know, you know, what more could you want, you know?" So, and it was time to make an album, and and you know, give it all you got, you know. Damn straight, and and the first album, full album that came out of that was the Southern Gentleman album. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, the great album. That from what I've heard, you sent me some tracks. I just thank you, brother. Stuff. One thing that I really like about what you do, aside before I go into my next question here, is um, and and me and the the boys talk about it because you know we spend a lot of time on the road in the car listening to music, going from town to town, and oh, cool. uh, there's one thing that's really missing from just rock and roll and that straight up ballsy badass rock. Everybody's got to have a some kind of gimmick now, you know. Nobody just wants to fucking rock out. And that's the thing that I love about the Gideon Smith and the Dixie Damned is you guys aren't afraid to just be rock and fucking roll. And that fucking oh, thank rule. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, brother. Well, you know, Damn I mean straight. I appreciate that. You know, like people, you know, you can say what you want. You can say metal, you can say, you know, Stoner rock, southern rock, you know, it's kind of like Lemmy. He always says it's all rock and roll. And, you know, it really is. You know, it's the subgenres and differences or whatever. But, you know, probably people from your generation and our generation, we say, you know, it's all rock and roll. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, it's not really like, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't even know what trends are. I don't follow them. I don't pay attention to any of it. I just play what comes out and do what I need to do. And um, I'm, I'm glad it does something good for you, man. So thank you so much. Damn straight, man. Well, and on that Southern Gentleman album, um, you work with the legendary Al Sutton, I am to understand. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you want to tell us what spawned that? Well, you know, it's through the, the connections in Detroit. Uh, you know, the small stone guys are based there and uh, the studio there. And uh, Al Sutton ended up mixing... Uh, Southern gentleman, and uh, you know he mixed the hell out of it, you know, and uh, so it, it wasn't really like uh, a, uh, a personal thing where I had met him beforehand. But uh, when I found out that we were going to work with him, I was very excited, and uh, you know that album uh, came out a very uh, great, great production, and and I remember we were all really blown away at the time with uh, with what we were hearing, like you know, man, you know, it's it's kind of like it was like I was just doing studio doing acoustic demos and coming up with ideas and we were doing practices or whatever and then we made this album and it was roaring out and and that guy's definitely uh, you know a very uh, highly regarded uh, producer so you know it's definitely an honor to uh, to have him uh, work on my stuff these years. Yeah, Al Sutton, if you don't know who that is, folks, I'm, the many mainstream acts that he's worked with more outside of rock and roll, and, and a lot in, you know, mainstream rock, but Leonard Skinner, uh, which uh, stood out to me as probably the, the biggest influence of the group for me, of the folks that he's worked with. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he's, yeah. he's done a lot, a lot of great stuff and uh, still does, and, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, cool guy, and then uh, you know, really appreciate the uh, the uh, chance to get to work with him and uh, in that studio. And uh, I think that uh, that era, you know, Southern Gentleman was uh, coming out of the gates, you know, at the time. And like I, I said, doing it again now, I kind of feel like that every few years. But I think that it's also uh, that was real early, you know, it was right after the first EP, and uh, getting to work with him was definitely uh, really exciting. I, I'd imagine, man. Uh, now, on that album, also that marked the first time that one of your songs appeared on television. Actually, I'm going to cut this question in half right now. We'll give our fans listening to the live the notice that we've got about five minutes left on the live stream. Fans, um, if Gideon has a moment and wants to continue the conversation, we can gladly continue on the archive after that. Uh, would you mind joining us for a few more moments after the show goes yeah, off the I'm air? With you. I'm with you, brother. All right. All right, brother. Okay, well, back to the question then. Uh, the Southern Gentleman album didn't mark the first time one of your songs appeared on television, a major television show, one of my all-time favorites, actually. HBO's The Sopranos, the song Dragon the River was on there. And since then, you've had songs on Sons of Anarchy, another show we've given a lot of press to here on the Midnight Black Mass, uh, Nitro Circus, Dog the Bounty Hunter, and many more. How did these opportunities come about, and is it possible that we will hear anything from 30 Weight on TV or film? Well, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, to, to answer your first part, um, it came about when uh, when Southern Gentleman came out. It started to spread around uh, with uh, the fan base and, um, and uh, a lot of uh, reviews and uh, sort of spreading out in the industry, and uh, and. Uh, had, Small Stone uh, helped me get into music licensing, and then uh, that's kind of where you you get your songs uh, in that area of of the industry. And um, someone uh, involved with Sopranos uh, wanted to use the song, and uh, we of course were uh, were really excited and uh, and went right with it. And that that opened the door uh, to uh, to those things occurring like. The, of other shows that you mentioned, and, uh, you know, everyone has been great, man. I mean, we love all those shows. You know, everybody loves Sopranos, uh, Sons of Anarchy, and uh, Nitro Circus, and, uh, you know, uh, so, so much, uh, so many cool shows, you know, and uh, knowing that you're a part of that, too, is, uh, is an honor, and uh, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to get your music out there in the world, and, um uh, for people to get turned on to what you do, and uh, so The Sopranos was like the definitely the first, like you said, mega uh, uh, introduction to that world. And uh, so uh, after it got into licensing with them, it's it's uh, it's carried on that way. With Thirty Weight, uh, definitely, you know, hope so. So you know, just just keep on uh, spreading it out there. Yeah, will do, and. Uh just maybe not far long enough in the process to know about that, but that's still in- incredibly awesome. And what does it feel like? Thank you so much, know, brother. Yes, man. Uh, and what, what does it feel like to know that, uh, you know, just sit, that's immortalized? I mean, it, beyond what you've done recording and the fact that bands thought enough of me to record a tribute album, this is immortalized in television history. Oh, man, I tell you, it's, it's my honor, and I'm, 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 all I can say is just that I'm honored uh, you know, with the, the other bands covering my songs, that's that's my honor, not theirs. I mean, I'm, it blows me away. And uh, with the, the, the you know the, the television shows like that, it's uh, it's surreal. And there's times where you don't even really uh, realize it because you're, you're so close to your work and what you do every day. And then other times where you step back and you're you're just uh, amazed that uh, your music was associated with. Uh, Things that were the, so uh, successful and, and household name, and uh, it dawned on it dawns on you sometimes. You know, you could be walking in the video store and you see Sopranos DVD, Sons Anarchy DVD, you see things, and you think, "Wow, I was on there," you know, or I'm, my my stuff's on there. And then I hear from fans of those shows that say, "That's how I found your band," or whatever. And uh, you know, it's an honor. I mean, I'll, you just it. it, it I think that it dawns on you, and then there's, there's other times where it just seems kind of surreal that, uh, you know, you know, with the beginning, like you said, Sopranos and and uh, everybody, you know, loves Sons of Anarchy. It's like, 
you, uh, you, 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 you know, you know so many people that enjoy it, and then one day uh, your song's on there. It's a, it's a great, uh, great fortune. Just off the cuff, are you familiar with much Sons of Anarchy? Have you watched the show at all? Uh, yes, I have. I, I definitely think it's a cool show, and uh, I'd heard about it before I saw it, before our, uh, my song was on there. I'd heard a lot about it, but I had not seen it yet. And then uh, then I got into watching it and checking it out. I think it's uh, really cool, man. Definitely killer. And uh, I think that it's, uh, you know, I can I can. I can I can dig it and I and I can see why it's so popular. You know, really quality, really cool, uh, engaging show. Do you think it's a fairly accurate depiction of the the biker lifestyle? Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, from my uh, my personal knowledge, uh, I would say that it's entertainment, but uh, definitely yes. And uh, uh, but I'm not claiming to be an expert, brother. And I think that would uh, there, there are other people that can answer that question in, in greater detail than me. But I do think that uh, I think so. Uh, if not, if anything else, they definitely uh, they've created a great show that uh, that's based on on that culture uh, or is intriguing uh, to people that have a love for that culture. And then you know if we've come up with something that uh, is uh, is really cool and and uh, you know so. Uh, right. I, I, I can answer it to that extent, but I uh, I can't claim to uh, to you know be an expert on it, you know. Oh no, yeah, not at all. Just uh, just personal curiosity more than anything. Uh, oh yeah. Now, well, it, well, how, how about you? You know, you what's your take on it? Um, I think it, about as much as The Sopranos probably is, just from documentaries and other things that I've watched, which was fairly accurate but glamorized to a certain point. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, right on. Well, it's a killer show, you know. I mean, and uh, it's right up there with, uh, you know, uh, the best in uh, many years. And, uh, hey, man, you know, I mean, everybody digs it. You know, I love it. think it's great. Hell, yeah. Hell, yeah. Well, but let's uh, talk about the book, Mr. Author, as well. Not only a, a well-traveled and well-versed musician, but an author. 2007, you released a book entitled Way of the outlaw spirit, which I found fascinating. I've only read snippets online. I hope to one day get a copy of the whole thing. This really comes across as a manifesto of a man who's lived a whole lot of life. But he's constantly seeking knowledge and self-improvement. Uh, do you care to discuss some of the philosophies about the book, just talk about the whole experience of that in general? Man, I really appreciate that. I thank you for your interest and your insight. And um, I think that... Um, uh, you know, uh, the book is, uh, it, was, it was, it's out of print, you know, it's, it was a collection of uh, just what was running through my head at the time, 2006 or seven. I had a lot of downtime, so I was writing uh, just what I needed to get out and uh, what was just running through my head. And uh, it was some stories from my life and then some philosophy. Uh, and, and I think that it's, um, it's just sort of what needed to come out. And, and, and I think that, uh, uh, a lot of it is, is positive thinking and uh, uh, reflections on, on subjects of uh, just I felt like addressing, and I think that, uh, you know, things I had to say at the time. Uh, I can't claim to be a writer. I never went to school for it. I'm not really a uh, – uh, I never thought I really would try to be a writer, but at the time I said I need to get this out, and this is what I'm going to do in my downtime for music. And um, I've always been a seeker. It's my nature to, to dive deeply into my studies and calling in life and strive onward to seek knowledge and better myself. And so with the book, I kind of wanted to encourage other people to do the same and uh, then address things that were important to me on my life, of course, like music and and uh, so many things. So, you know, um, I'm glad that uh, it's, it's done anything good for anyone. Uh, I got a lot of great feedback from it and, uh, I'm uh, real thankful. It was just it was a project I took on myself and said, I'm going to do this for this period of time and because I was not as active musically at that point. And uh, then, uh, you know, the day it came out, I was, I w I was already hit step back from it. It was a, a culmination of that particular goal, you know. 
Absolutely. I really was intrigued just by your whole stance on the power of positive thinking. I, do you care to elaborate a little more on that? I'd oh, really sure. be interested to hear some of that. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, I think, um, man, I was raised by my parents to strive very hard to be the best at what, what I do, to believe in myself, never give up. Uh, you know, you can be anything you want to be if you believe, persevere, you demonstrate determination, uh, self-discipline, belief, drive, willpower. It gave me a very intense focus. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like they, you know, there are you know, no problems, they're just challenges. If someone says you can, you prove to them you can. If you get knocked off the horse, you jump right back on, you know, that kind of thing. You know, if you shoot an arrow, you hit a bullseye. If you don't, you shoot another one until you do. And so I kind of was... Um, uh, was uh, gearing up my whole life to to be very uh, intense, driven, uh, focused, and, and and believe positivity. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, things I studied uh, from a young age, you know, till now, you know, Castaneda, my Moto Musashi, and uh, Leve, you know, all kinds of stuff. Things that led to periods in my life where I was intensely studying many belief systems, philosophies, uh, you know, uh, and then I I still carry books with me, you know, like Sun Tzu or Sun Tzu Art of War, uh, Book of Five Rings, uh, classic uh, positive thinking books, and they continue to speak to me. And so I've always been really absorbed in uh, uh, many, many things. And it's like you said, with uh, finding your own way, you can – you kind of take what speaks to you as important and you disregard the rest and uh, then just drive onward. If you if you find uh, power, strength, peace, love, inspiration, uh, you know, ways to handle, uh, overcome adversity, many of those things, wherever you find them, that's where you need to find it. It's just a mask for what you need to find. And you work your way through the different masks as, as to what appeals to you. And then I think that uh, with with my stuff, writing at the time, I just like I said, I wanted to encourage other people to do the same and to say, you know, uh, you know, this is some of the things I went through, some things I have to say. Um, I'm grateful anybody wanted to read it or cared about it. And then, you know, that was what it what it was. I I wasn't going to write a book uh, just about rock and roll or a book of just lyrics or something. I I felt like I had a lot to get out. So kind of sort of like a lot building up it, it just came out at the right time I look back on it and I think I probably could have added 200 pages I could have taken things out whatever but Stone to Stone it was written in 2007 and I'm just uh, thankful that uh, that people uh, did something that's done something good for people or that it does still and uh, it's out of print I hope I can uh, uh, maybe I'll reprint it maybe I won't you know but uh, you know, like I said, the day that it came out and it was done and I put it on the shelf in my house, that was kind of like the culmination of it, you know. Oh, I can only imagine that. That's got to be a rewarding moment. Oh, man, so much. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, well, you know, I, I was just listening to you talk about the the various cultures and religions that you'd studied, uh, just knowledge and, and literature throughout. Uh, history, just going really back to the, the dawn of time and various cultures and civilizations, um, which I think is a very, a, a very respectable way to go about creating a belief system is to to go through everything that's out there because that, if you're just raised up in something which so many people in the South are, then uh, you are just you're programmed to do that and not seek any other knowledge. I think that can be somewhat dangerous. I've heard you're a, a big proponent of worldwide religious freedom. Uh, do you care to discuss some thoughts on that? Sure. I definitely agree with what you're saying, especially to the South or to American uh, Americans in general. I, the, the, the average American or average uh, person in the South, they tend to think that uh, you're spiritual. It means you're Christian or the, you're either a Christian or you don't have religion. If you found religion, it's because you found Christianity, and uh, they think that it's the church across the street and there's not really any other option. You either find your way there or you, you're, you know, uh, you're lost or whatever. 
and I don't agree with that. And I think that uh, your average person's not a seeker. They don't. They you know they might not seek out, uh, uh, read a lot, or ask questions, or go that deep, or think. And then there might be times in their life where they do. But it's um, it, it's it, to me, I, I can't stand the idea of that. I think that you 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 got to get in the deep end of the pool. You can't stay in the shallow end of the water to get the most out of life and to learn all you can and to be all you can. And uh, you know, uh, I totally uh, agree with you when you come when you speak of of the South like that. And and, and I don't criticize how this is my I love the South and this is you know this is uh, where I, I'm from and I love that. But I think that uh, it's good that and as times have moved on that uh, people are more open minded to pursuing many things and finding their own truth. Uh, that's not a, a, a dig on Christianity. That's just saying that there's many things. There are many options and many things like I spoke about, like masks that you can, the mask behind what you need to find it. You go for the mask that appeals to you. And it's like, you know, when you ask about freedom of religion, I just think, you know, not necessarily religious, but spirituality is is a very personal thing. So I believe you should be whatever you want to be. You should be whatever you, you know, calls to you. You should be able to, to be that, and people should respect that. And I'm going to follow what I need to do and encourage you to do the same, anyone do the same. And uh, so, you know, it comes from, you know, respect, and I, and I hate to see people uh, disrespected or held down when it comes to seeking uh, mysteries and, you know, life and wherever they find enjoyment. Like I said, peace, power, strength, love, inspiration, uh, you know, whatever, you know, that, that they need to find, they find it from... Uh, what they need to get it from, and so you know, no, no, nobody's right to, to tell someone else they can or can't believe in anything. You know, you 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 follow what you need, what you need to be. You know, and uh, it's like a it's like music on the wind. You know, it calls you if you don't follow it, you're never going to be happy. So, you know, I believe. Uh, you know, I'm American. I have I've traveled, but I think, that, of course, America we have religious freedom. But uh, I think that. Uh, you know, all over the world, people should be free to be what they need to be, and uh, especially when it comes to uh, deep parts of their spirit. And uh, if you, in the end, it's all within you. It's all what's going on inside yourself. So the journey is really only inward. But on the outside, you know, people are seeking experience. The experience is only inward, what they feel, you know, unless they're sharing it with somebody. But it's like on the outside, if people don't respect your inward journey, then, you know, it's I don't, I don't uh, have any respect for them. So I think that people should be free to uh, to follow their heart in uh, those areas. Very, very excellent thoughts. I, I just a, a real privilege to have such a, a deep thinking person like yourself on the show, Gideon. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, Dude, thank you, brother, and thank you for the questions and uh, and the insight. Uh, just as we're getting ready to wrap up here in the next couple of moments, um, just in the vein of expanding your mind, and you can you know, comment this question if you want. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to tread as lightly on it as possible, but um, there is a certain school of thought that there are certain psychedelic enhancements that one can ingest that um, allows you access to maybe deeper parts of your psyche, greater parts of your brain, or even deeper parts of your spirit. Uh, in those experiences, uh, do you agree with that, or have you had any experience in that realm? I, I will be glad to share in mine. Well, you know, I think to each man his own path, and I think that, uh, you know, the you, you uh, like I said, you know, you, people – People go through a lot of adventures before they reach places that they need to. And uh, as far as my personal experiences, you know, I I think that, uh, you know, there's low roads and high roads. It's up to you what you, what you, uh, the, the methods to which you, uh, you need to take you there. But uh, with me, man, you know, it's music, you know, it's music and magic. And uh, music and magic are only two letters different, you know. So it's like all you got to do is, is you get in sync with the uh, the sound, and it, it'll take you where you need to go, you know. And then that's it's part of the power of uh, the things you love, you know, music, uh, horror films, and books, and uh, and you know, a lot of things. They 
the, they're creating a rhythm, and the rhythm is like a there's a rhythm to everything and sound, you know, and the, uh, the rhythm to the, the muscles in your body, the rhythm to the, you know, your speech, your vibration, you know, and so the key is the sound. That's that's the way I look at it. So I get your question, but we're like definitely, brother. But what I'm saying is like with me, the 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 key was the uh, what's you know what's coming out of that speaker, and you know what's the What's the uh, the the high road opens with uh, with the distortion very loud, you know. So <laughs> you I see what I mean? That, my yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, that's one. Now, uh, just wrapping up here, we I guess the, the one of the last topics we can discuss here uh, before I let you get some plugs in and and whatever else you've got coming up that you want to announce to our audience. Uh, we know you're an avid fan of martial arts, motorcycles, cars, we've heard. Uh, we love horror films, as you probably heard when you first came on the line there during the Muji Movie Minute. Uh, what are your thoughts on the horror genre, and would you care to discuss some of your favorite films? I'm with you, brother. I'm a huge horror movie fan, for sure. You know, I love them. You know, I've, I've, I was listening to you and, you and your friend discuss, and uh, I'm probably the same to where I've, I've seen about, there's probably a how many have I not seen? You know, I've seen about all of them. You know, I'm one of those guys too, where I, I'm seeking them all out. You know, I'm just out of interest or entertainment, and I can't even remember all the ones I've seen. You know, and it's um, it's a uh, you know definitely a love of mine for sure. Um, I think that uh, some of the classics. Uh, you know, I love the Hammer movies. I love Stanley Kubrick's Dracula, Wicker Man. Uh, you know, Captain Kronos. Uh, I think Simon King of Witches is a great movie. Uh, I think Clive Barker's uh, Lord of Illusions, great movie, very underrated, very underpromoted. Uh, I like uh, Lord of Illusions even better than Hellraiser stuff. Um, I thought Pan's Labyrinth was killer. Uh, I think that uh, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, Dracula, is a powerful film. Uh, a lot of people don't like it. I think it's great. Uh, as far as more recent stuff, um, uh, Midnight Meat Train, Last Exorcism, um, and uh, going back a few years, Ninth Gate, many years ago, is definitely uh, really cool. And uh, recently, I saw Troll Hunter. I thought Troll Hunter's killer. It was really cool. So I've but, not seen Troll Hunter, but what about Oh, you got to check it out, man. Yeah. He sent me a link the other day and said I had to watch it. So as soon as I get around to that, it's happening. You know, I mean, uh, I think it's not for everybody, but I also think it's really cool. Uh, if you like the documentary type stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I kept hearing about it for a year and finally uh, was able to rent a copy here in Charlotte. And, uh, yeah, I thought it was really cool, man. So, yeah, I love horror movies, you know. And um, uh, the most recent probably, I guess, Last Exorcism or uh, Saw Midnight Me Train, uh, stuff like that. But, uh, you know, what about you? You see anything good Yeah, you can clue me in on? Oh, man, we're watching. And as far as new movies, um, I'd recommend Kevin Smith's Red State, though not really a by-the-book horror film. That, that's just a great film and, and a great statement on religion and the, the worst effects of that on folks. Um, I would definitely recommend that. As far as other recent movies, uh, man, another not-quite-horror, but Hobo with a Shotgun I enjoyed. Was oh, yeah, I've heard about movie. that, yeah. With Rutger Hauer, um, uh, we just watched actually Burnt Offerings for the first time. An old classic okay, is yeah. one of our weekly reviews. Robert recommended that, and, and there's so cool, many of those yeah. late seventies, early eighties that I hadn't seen. Surprisingly, because I, I, if I've seen five hundred horror movies, I've seen one. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, you know, uh, man, it's, what's cool too is rediscovering or hearing about one you missed. It's really great, you know. And, it might be an old classic, and it's new to you. You know, it's it's, uh, it's a real joy, and uh, uh, that's cool, man, for sure. You know, I'd break that out and watch that again, and uh, uh, that's there's a lot of good stuff out there. I wish that there were more newer ones that I was interested in, more recent films, but uh, you know, I break out the old favorites, and uh, and uh, you know, a lot of great stuff, man. I I definitely praise the original Wicker Man very highly. I think that's it was one that a lot of people just uh, blocked out for years, but in the, you know, it's become more popular in recent times. But um, 
I was watching some uh, deleted, uh, no, not deleted scenes, but back uh, interviews with Christopher Lee, and he was telling a lot of stories behind the film when they were making it, and it's fascinating to hear him talk about it, you know. Oh, I could listen to Christopher Lee talk about paint drying, so that oh, I'm yeah, sure that man. it would be interesting. Oh, yeah. And that is just an all-time classic film. Uh, the oh, Nick yeah, Cage yeah. remake, not so much, but the original is is just fucking great. Yeah, right on, man, for sure. And um, you know, cool stuff. Do you see? Uh, Do you see? Drag me to hell. That was very much. Uh, yes, I, yeah. I'd almost forgotten about that. I love Drag Me to Hell. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. I saw it in the theater. It was so much like Evil Dead. You know, reminds you so much of the. Uh, the old uh, series like that, and, um, you know, I kept trying to convert people to it. I couldn't get anybody into it, and finally God, I got a few people. Yeah, oh, okay, I got you. I got a few people That's to watch weird. it and one over. Uh, uh, one of my good friends uh, saw it in the theater with me, and then they, they thought it was great, and then afterwards I couldn't get anybody into it, and uh, finally, you know, uh, people started to, to talk about it, but except for a little bit of CGI type stuff, you know, I still thought it was great. Yeah, you, of course, you had Sam Raimi in the director's helm of that. But, you know, as you mentioned, the Evil Dead the homages, which were definitely there. But I thought it was a unique mix of that and, like, the old universal feel. Like, the old oh, lady yeah, really yeah. had the vibe of the the gypsy lady and the wolf man, you know. And, and it just oh, yeah, really, that's cool. I, yeah. I really enjoyed that. I, I thought it was a great film. Yeah, for sure. That's really cool. Well, all right, man. Uh, we're wrapping up. I just want to thank you again for for coming on the show. Uh, just the final question, and then after you answer, go ahead and plug away for your your upcoming appearances, the album, anything else that I might have missed, and, and any final words you might have for the fans. But uh, Gideon, what music are you currently spinning in your record player? Any bands that you want to promote here while you're on the air with me? Man, I tell you what, I listen to a lot of old stuff and. Uh, Lately, cranking up the favorites, uh, David Allen Coe, The Cult, The Doors, Almond Sabbath, Motorhead, Blue Cheer, Sisters of Mercy, uh, you know, um, classic uh, favorites, you know, over the years. Uh, so, no, I don't really have any new additions right now, but I'm, uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there I probably need to check out, and I'm kind of leaning heavily on my on my favorites right now, but... Uh, Yesterday I was cranking up some co, and uh, I am looking forward to what the uh, the cult will do in the next album. And uh, I've been wearing out the uh, the door strange days, uh, and so you know a lot of a lot of old stuff, man. Some classic country, uh, rock and roll, uh, early morbid angel, and uh, a little bit of uh, you know uh, Janis Joplin stuff like that. A wide variety, and it, it always entertains me that uh, most of our guests have this, about the same <laughs> range of, of years in terms of music. It, it's like late sixties to like mid eighties, and that's where we all kind of our, our focal. Uh, the, the point is, is that, but um, but anyway, I, again, Gideon, thank you for coming on the show. What what do you have coming up that you would like to promote on the live? or uh, the archive now of the Midnight Black Mass, my friend. Well, my friend, first, I'd just like to thank you for having me on here. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, doing your, uh, uh, you know, uh, interview with me and uh, your insights, enthusiasm. You know, thank you so much. I uh, hope I've been able to uh, follow you all right, man. It's been a, a long, crazy couple of days, but uh, very, very glad to be on here. I want to say thank you to you first, for sure. And, um Thank you to uh, my friend Robert you mentioned for uh, introducing you to my music. I know that he had uh, he had told you about my stuff, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I'd like to thank my band members, uh, very fantastic musicians I've been playing with, and uh, and and first and foremost to the the fans of my music, who have supported my music all these years. You know, very uh, grateful uh, to loyal, uh, strong following and. Guys are the blood of my heart to keep me alive and and well and and, and uh, inspired. And uh, thank you to all of them. Uh, and uh, definitely a big thank you to you, Rev. You're the man. You know, thank you for taking your time, brother. Hey, absolutely, Gideon. Hope you can join us again sometime down the road, my friend. 
I'd love to, man, definitely. And, uh, man, you have a killer night, man. You too, brother. Keep blasting holes in the motherfucking speakers, my friend. Have a good one. Hey, you know it, man. Thank you, brother. See ya. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that was Gideon Smith from Gideon Smith and the Dixie Damned. And a fantastic guest, one of the longest interviews I do believe we've conducted here on the show yet. Uh, but so so glad to have him on. Such great insight and, and history uh, told us a lot. And, and you need to go check out his music. Go to iTunes.com or your local record store if you still are lucky enough to have one of those and pick up your copy of 30 Weight coming out Tuesday, October the 11th. And, of course, as we announced earlier in the broadcast, the king of country and western troubadours, Squidbilly star Unknown Henson has agreed to appear on the Midnight Black Mass. We will be hosting a special edition also on Tuesday, October the 11th, with Unknown Henson here on the show. And our guest next week, fans, is going to be none other than former Ring of Honor star, former TNA star, uh, currently star in Dragon Gate Wrestling, and the man running the ship down at Rampage Pro Wrestling, my good buddy, I know him back from the NWA Wild Side days, and actually even beyond that, good God, like fucking Dalton, Georgia, TriStar Wrestling, uh, Jimmy Ray is going to be on the show next Thursday night at midnight. We're going to have a great conversation. Jimmy's been in the news lately talking about some struggles that he has overcome, and we're looking forward to hearing his story, but not getting all heavy on that as well. We'll let Jimmy say everything he wants to say, but we're going to have some fun and, and have some lighthearted discussion as well. We're going to talk about, of course, the things you love, comics, movies, horror films in particular, heavy metal, rock and roll of all kinds, outlaw, country, stand-up comedy, hell, any of the, the entertainment on the fringe, as we like to say. But fans, that wraps up the extremely lengthy edition of the Midnight Black Mass. We are very happy to have you aboard. Thank you for joining us. And again, you may be the Antichrist. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was.